Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. And I am very happy to say that I've got uh, one of my favorite guests here on the show, and that is Lauren Christensen. Hi, Lauren. How are you doing? Hi, Wim. Glad to be here. Uh, it, it's been a while. I think it's about two years since we did the last interview on the podcast. And yeah, I, yeah. Very... What's up with that? It's crazy. It's crazy. It's, it's all my fault. You know, Belgium's, fall, Belgium's yeah. falling apart. It is. Yeah. The U.S. seems to be having some issues too. No, we're fine here. Absolutely fine. <laughs> well, um, and in preparation for this interview, um, I, I asked a bunch of my patrons if they had questions for you, and everybody loves you because I got the oh. most questions ever. So uh, I wouldn't be able to get to all of them because there were too many. But uh, I made a, a made sure that I could, could add a bunch, and and you gave me a couple from uh, people who asked uh, some stuff uh, on your Facebook page, I think. So um, we're just gonna just gonna go right into it, and uh, I'll give you the first question. That's from one of my patrons, Lars Sudman, and he asked, "Lauren is a very prolific writer. I would be curious to understand what his writing routine, so like hours per day, words per day, do you write every day, and so on." as well as knowledge management system is, and that would mean how to store ideas and thoughts and references. So, great question. Yeah. Uh, well, I've been writing, I think I started writing in, uh, professionally in, in 1975 and wrote a, a book. And then I, once that book came out, then I just um, took a few years to study the art of writing or the, 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 the art and the business of writing. And it took about seven or eight years and I never took a writing course. I just bought books on it. In fact, I can't even type, or I can't type well. I have 60 books out and I don't type well. Uh, but so you don't need typing lessons, so don't bother. Uh, so yeah, I just got a, a, there's a magazine called Writer's Digest and they have their own publishing um, uh, outfit that puts out how to write books. Uh, and I just studied those. I just read those, read articles, uh, read grammar books and punctuation books, all these really exciting books. Uh, and then I started, again, I started doing articles, uh, magazine articles throughout the 80s. Uh, and then I started doing uh, books toward the end of the 80s and focused primarily on books uh, throughout the 80s and the 90s up to the present. Um, my work day, I retired from the Portland Police in uh, 97. Up to that point, I would just write uh, on weekends or write, uh, it was a slow day, I'd just write on the back of a napkin or something, some ideas for a magazine article. <clears throat> but after the very next day after I retired in 1997, I started the schedule that I still keep, which is Monday through Friday, about 8.30 to 3 o'clock. Uh, it's not solid hardcore writing, but I'm, you know, I'm checking Facebook and I'm taking my dogs out and all that stuff. But it's, it's um, about six and a half hours. If I'm on a deadline, it might go to four or four thirty. On the weekends, if my wife has something to do in the morning, I just write until about noon. I don't write at all on Sunday. I want to, but I let that itch kind of uh, grow so that I'm ready to go on Monday. And uh, word count, I, I've never paid any attention to word count. Uh, I just, um, if it's, I try to have two books going at the same time, a fiction and a nonfiction. Uh, if it's a fiction, I, I focus on a scene and I try to at least get a rough draft of that scene uh, before I end the day. I don't always make it, but I try to. Uh, with the, uh, the, the nonfiction, did I say nonfiction? The fiction is a scene. The the nonfiction is just an idea or maybe a chapter that I'm working on. And um, I just try to get that that day. Um, I try to get a, a, as good a first draft as possible. Hemingway said that your first draft should be shit. And I always accomplish that. And, <laughs> and, and that's the way it should be. You should just get that stuff down. And then that's your left brain. Then let your right brain come in and clean it up. Just get it down because <clears throat> you'll forget. You'll forget if you don't. Yeah. Um, so it uh, books take me an average of uh, six months, eight months. The longest book was On Combat, which took 31 months. Uh, but I had a couple other books. I think, in fact, you and I had a book. We were doing the... Uh, yeah, I think the, we did the uh, heavy bag book then. Yeah, or Fighter's Body book. Um, was that was that during... I'm not, I'm not sure. It's been, it's been a while. Yeah. Could, could be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was one of those. We had that going, had a couple others. And anyway, um, so that's basically my schedule. I'm perfectly happy with that. And um, yeah, <clears throat> and for for the listeners who who don't know, obviously Lauren uh, is the the person who got me started writing. 
So, um, and uh, I'm not going to repeat that story, but uh, Lauren and I have written a couple of books together. And it's uh, if, if you like my writing, thank him or blame him. It's up to you. Well, but, wait. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, um, yeah, I remember at, at one time, I don't know which year it was, but it's been a while, but you had about five books going all at the same time. And and then you, then you said I'll never do that again, and then I think you did like the same thing next year or something. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the timing is just wrong. It, that, the time you're talking about, it was seven. Yeah, was seven books, all in different phases. Uh, they'd a couple of them had been at a publisher for a while, then they decided to work on it, and just and I go, ah, you know, yeah. no sleep and just yeah. So now I just do two. <laughs> yeah. And do you do you have like a, a special system that you use to to like keep your IDs in check or oh. or do you write stuff down or how do you do that? Yeah, uh, I have I just do the folders on the computer. Um, yeah. For example, I'm just looking at my computer here. Uh, the fiction I'm doing a short story fiction. Actually, it's not a short story. It's going to be a novella. Yeah. Uh, that's a little bigger than a short story, smaller than a, a novel, about a hundred pages, hundred ten pages. It's called uh, just a working title. It's Cato, like nice. Bruce Lee, Cato, but it's not about Bruce Lee. Uh, so in that, I have different ideas. I write up on a you know on a on a Word doc, and I just send it into that file. Um, um, different ideas for endings, different ideas for scenes, other fictions. Uh, some of the fiction novels I wrote. Uh, my wife and I would travel to a location. We would travel to San Francisco, and we scoped out a number of uh, locations we wanted. To have scenes in that in that book, yeah. and all those got a file. You know, you can have file within a file. And the fiction, the nonfiction books are much more complex. And I have you know a dozen, maybe twenty uh, files within a file of different chapters, different um, research information I've I got, uh, and I just throw them in there. Some I never use. The same with the fiction. I may have some quotes that I want a character to say, uh, and I never get to it. I never use it because the story. The story has a its own life. When I sit down with the fiction, I said, "Today I'm going to have Cato trip over the sidewalk," you know, and and, <laughs> and I'm I'm working on it. And by the end of it, I have a whole different scenario. The fiction, the the characters just took off with it. So some of the stuff I don't use, but it's good to have it in there. And some of the stuff I use for other books. So, yeah. And and it wouldn't surprise people to know that I have a very similar system because I learned it from you. <laughs> yeah. And then I, posts I, I, all over. I get posts all over my desk here. So yeah, I, I don't use posts, but um, what I have is I have uh, per book I have one big folder, and then I have. I'm, I'm just looking at um, the last one we did together, the Fighter's Guide to Hardcore Heavy Bag Training. Uh, I have about ten subfolders. And then a separate one for pictures, one for uh, graphs, one for the first edition, uh, first rough draft. Then we have the second draft, and uh, I've got about five folders, just all the different uh, drafts that we did. And then we have all, all these all these separate uh, word documents of uh, per chapter, neatly numbered, chapter one, two, three, and so on. Oh, so, you're better uh, than I am. Yeah, I, I I got worse over time. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I added more. Uh, nuances to my uh, <laughs> to my to my fo uh, filing system, uh, uh, but it it works. I mean, I know that some some writers are really they they can keep it all in their head, um, all the stuff that they wanna that they wanna write down. But I I can't. I forget stuff. Uh, I'm assuming that did you have that? Does that happen to you too? Or oh yeah like... yeah, it's uh, I'm like uh, Mo of the Three Stooges. You know, I'm trying <laughs> to think, but nothing's happening. You know, so that's that's where. Uh, yeah, I can't keep it that way. And, and I always get ideas at night. And w weirdly, I shouldn't, don't tell anybody this, but I get I get a tremendous number of ideas in a shower. Okay. Uh, in fact, I could not figure out where this scenario was going to take place in my uh, novella. And a couple of nights ago, washing the armpits, and boom, it pops <laughs> in my head. I write it down on my dresser, and then I bring it down to my office the next day. And I've had that happen so many times. I don't know what it is. Maybe because I'm not thinking about it. Yeah. You know, it just pops in there. Who knows? I, I have a friend who is an, uh, he was, um, a literary agent, and, and she goes over manuscripts in her bath. She says that's yeah. where she thinks best. Uh, so, you know, you're not the only one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, do you have something that you do to kind of like um, 
you know, get the muse to come help you out and, and get the writing flowing? Do you have like a routine or special music that you put on or something like, something along those lines? Uh, well, other writers would probably hate this, but I've never had writer's block. I just okay. sit down and just boom. Now, if I'm starting a book, uh, that first chapter may not end up being the first chapter. You know, that happens. But uh, no, um, I work. Well, a couple exceptions. Um, when I did a short story called Parts, P-A-R-T-S, yep. it's a horror. And I listened to some really good horror music while I was writing that because I wrote it in August. It's hot and sunny and the children are playing outside the window. You know? <laughs> and uh, it's not like a couple other ones that I've written where in the winter and the you know, the bony tree limbs are scraping on the window. Uh, so this horror uh, music was fantastic. In fact, I included it in a book. I have a link to it, and people can bring up that music while they read it if they want. So uh, so that really helped with that. Um, if, I have, if I'm working on a fiction that has a strong Asian theme, uh, then I listen to Asian music. Yeah. Um, uh, when I was writing the uh, Vietnam book, uh, I listen to a lot of Vietnamese music, not only Vietnamese music, but American music that was popular at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I can't listen to it for very long because it gets on my nerves, but it kind of gets me going a little bit. Yeah. But I've been very fortunate not to have writer's, writer's block, and I very seldom get going in a wrong direction and have to delete it and come back. If yeah. I get going in a wrong direction, it's usually never, never far, further than two sentences. And yeah. then I have to go back. And um, I've just been, I've been blessed that way, I guess. So I don't know. Well, I think it's maybe because, you know, you, you, you one of the things you taught me, you know, really in the beginning is like make an outline, <laughs> start with an outline, as opposed to just randomly starting chapters left and right and, and, right. and, and hoping to end somewhere uh, correctly. And every time, um, that I ran into trouble when I was writing uh, an article or a book is because I didn't follow my outline or the outline wasn't good enough. Yeah. So uh, that, that maybe that that's also the secret to you you not having any writer's block, or in addition to in addition to to making the formula work. Yeah, do an outline, but I, we talked about this way back. I rarely yeah. follow it, but just yeah. the act of making an outline exactly. gives some structure in your mind, and it's the same with the fiction. Oh. I'll create backstories on the characters, even if I don't use that backstory in the story. Yeah. Um, and certain things that I want to happen, sometimes those things happen, sometimes they don't. If I have a really cool thing I want to happen, it, it usually happens. Um, uh, other things is just sort of, I put a question, maybe he, I put a maybe, then a colon, you know, the guy falls down a stairwell, you know, that's just a thought. And then I may or may not use that. But so yeah. I guess that's a form of an outline for fiction. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to uh, Lars's second question, and that is: Lorne has trained and gained black belts in various martial arts. What is his advice on this to others? So, how do you approach training in different martial arts? Um, what was the order, for instance, in which you started training? Do you have like an anchor art, like a main art? So, how do we go about, you know, being as trained as you are? Um. Well, I started in 1965, so there wasn't that many things around. Um, I started in an art called Kong Sudo, K-O-N-G-S-U. It was a Korean Japanese art. All the all the forms, katas, were Japanese. Uh, it wasn't uh, heavy on kicks. It was mostly hands. It was a heavily Jap uh, uh, Japanese influenced Korean art. Uh, and then from that, I did a number of other kick punch, I call them kick punch arts, everything from Muay Thai to various Japanese form, uh, styles, that sort of thing, little bits here and there. And uh, those were my core art. And around uh, late 70s, then I started uh, learning some grappling techniques because I became the, the head instructor for the police academies. And so we had to switch to various grappling techniques. And then in the 80s, then I got in jiu-jitsu very heavily, and Aiki jiu-jitsu, and with a little bit of chin na, Chinese uh, jiu-jitsu, some Aikido, um, wrestling, that sort of thing. And then around eight, 83, about the same time, I, I started Arnis, stick fighting art. So what I found that that gave 
uh, my students and I, it gave us multiple ranges to work from. We had this, the remote kick, the remote uh, stick art, uh, stick striking, which is about the same as your as your kicks. It's, it can be a little longer depending on how far you stretch out. A largo movement, you know, uh, and then the kicks. Uh, which is, uh, like we call it range three. Range two would be punches, elbows. Um, range one would be um, uh, claws, elbows, headbutts, knees. And if you want to get, call it range zero, uh, that would be grappling techniques. Mainly we just go three, two, and one. <clears throat> so the student starts, it, uh, so we have drills where the student goes three, two, one. Yeah. And sometimes we'll go one, two, three. So you can escape from that close in a close quarter fighting to a middle range and a long range doing techniques. The whole idea is to fill those beats of time with your stuff. Don't give your adversary, your opponent time to do his stuff. And so uh, that was the whole purpose there is um, I, once I got a black belt in Arnis, um, I stopped the formal training because I had enough for what I needed for our system. <clears throat> and, um, and that gave us enough tools to to use a stick, to use a um, rolled up magazine, to use a knife, and to use hands. And all in Arnis, they call it in the Filipino martial art, they call it translating. Uh, so, and the beauty of Arnis is you have long distance techniques and you also have close techniques. And the way Remy Pressos taught it, the, my instructor, is you also have grappling techniques as he learned grappling along the way. <clears throat> Uh, the Aiki Jiu-Jitsu um, is lots and lots of good, good control techniques, uh, some ground stuff, uh, but lots of lots of joint manipulation uh, using pain compliance and using leverage. A lot of people, uh, when, in, as a police officer, I ran into lots of people for one reason or another, didn't feel pain. They were high on drugs. Their muscle mass was too dense. Their fat mass was too dense. They were totally mentally deranged, or they liked it. There were some of those guys who just liked yeah. it. Uh, so those kind of guys, uh, we just switched to a leverage technique. We're using uh, different balance manipulation to take the guy down, get control of him, that sort of thing. And if you if you look at how um, your students are learning now, would you say that? What your system is, is, is it's a, a full blend of all the things that you you did before. So you take parts from, from the karate, from the jiu-jitsu and so on. So you blend them. But um, how, how would you advise somebody who doesn't have uh, that same experience? So they start from, let's say, uh, a karate or kung fu background and they want to move into, for instance, a grappling art or um, a weapon-based art like Arnie's. What would be a good approach, do you think, uh, to, to go to switch from like a, a different style of art? Like a, if, if you do Shotokan and you do Shotokai and then you do Goju Ryu and so on, um, they're different styles, but they're still in the same family uh, of martial arts. Let's call it that. But what if you switch families? What if you go to those crazy Chinese styles that I like to do? So uh, <laughs> what, what would you advise people who want to do that? Well, some people are limited by where they live. They yeah. just don't have the number of schools, the variety of schools like you do in a larger city. <clears throat> when I get people here in where I live ask me what should I, what should I take, I always tell them try to find a style where they combine the kick punch arts with at least with grappling arts. If they got artists, lots and lots of people are teaching artists now because it got so widespread so quickly, beginning in the 80s. But at least get a punch, a kick punch art and a grappling art. It doesn't have to be a totally involved grappling art, but it should have a number of techniques that fit uh, your slant. In my case, the slant has always been the street, or at least it has been for the last, I've been, I'm going on 54 years in, in the martial arts, so at least the last 45 years, maybe more than that, it's been the street. So art slant is, it has to be applicable to the street. And it can't be just a cool technique. Once in a while, we'll do an absurd technique just because it's kind of fun to do. But it has to be, most of the time, it has to be applicable to the street. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
So somebody will come in with a technique. I saw this the other day. This is cool. I said, yeah, it's cool, but uh, can you see it working? Uh, or I say, I don't know if it's going to work, but let's play with it and see what can happen. Maybe we can modify it a little bit and make it work, you know, that sort of thing. So if you can find an art that teaches both, great. If you can't, the best next, the best, uh, next thing is to books, videos. Wim's got some great videos. I just finished watching Why, yours the other you. night. <laughs> you know, the other night, and uh, I have a lot of corrections for you on that. But no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no, it's a great video. It's a great video. Uh, a a simple concept from which you can add and and grow from and and apply stuff that you may already know or stuff that you find in the future. So, uh, so and then get those things. Get a buddy who's in the same school. He wants to do some grappling. Bite them over to your house and work on it, you know, once or twice a week and 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 grow from there. And as soon as you maybe eventually you'll 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 run into a guy who's fairly skilled and have him come over and and tidy up what you've learned and, and correct anything that you may be doing incorrectly or or tell you ways to do it even better. Okay, okay, great. Well, I think I'm gonna move on to the next question then, and that one is from D. Um and he asked if it isn't too late. A bit of off topic, but maybe I was wondering if Lauren has a book or books that have been a big influence <laughs> on his writing, as in a book he would recommend to anybody who has an interest in writing themselves, fiction or nonfiction. You kind of answered that a little bit, but uh, is there anything specific? Yeah, they, um, in fiction, uh, even though uh, I've, I'm working on my 10th short story and I've written four novels and only one of those short stories is a horror and only one of those novels has a horror flavoring throughout it but I read a lot of horror just be, if, if it's good horror uh, I'm saying that right right because I can't hear myself I'm not saying horror but I'm saying horror <laughs> yeah. no, you're good <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, in my side just sound like horror what um, because if it's a good horror uh the writers are very descriptive and they can milk a sentence with as few words and make it powerful and make you feel uh the environment feel what the characters are going through um give you a little bit of anxiety of what's going to happen around the next corner that sort of thing and uh, you can use that in you can use that in other fiction your modern romance your harlequin romance or something uh you can use that concept. So I read, I just read a lot of a lot of horror, some thrillers, but just a lot of horror. Um, in the nonfiction, I don't read a lot of nonfiction of late because I do. I read so much of it when I'm working on something. Uh, right now, we're working on a, a book. Um, uh, I won't say what it is because it we'll talk about it later. But uh, it requires a lot of reading on the subject. So I do a lot of that just online. Or I'll print yeah. something up and read it uh, up when I'm upstairs watching TV or something. Um, but find writers that you like. Now, some people say never read in your genre. If you're writing thriller, don't read in thriller. That's just up to you. Every, every, every One thing you can do, and I really enjoyed this way back, is I'd get books about how writers write. There's lots of books out there with, excuse me, say, 10 authors talk about their writing or 20 authors talk about their writing, everything from how they set it up, how they do some of these things that were just asked, uh, how they read. You got to read. If you're going to write, you got to read like a crazy guy. Just read, 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 read. Uh, some of the stuff you're going to use, but you indirectly pick up things on writing, uh, sentence structure. What I read something, I laugh. I go, okay, why did I laugh at that? How did the guy set it up? Kind of reads, ruins the story sometimes, you know. But yeah. okay, that that kind of that was spooky. Why was that spooky? What did he do to make that spooky? That sort of thing. That makes me want to read. Turn that. Uh, start right away with the next chapter. What did he do that hooked me into turning the page to the next chapter? So so you read analytically as well as for knowledge as well as for enjoyment. Yeah. Well, makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, then moving on to the next question, which is from Jakob Holly, and he says, maybe this is too relevant, but being a hard style, quote unquote, uh, practitioner, what difference does Lawrence see between internal and external martial arts, practically speaking? 
we discussed this a little bit before we started recording, uh, so uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit. I, I think it's a it's an interesting question, and I don't think you've had the opportunity to talk about this a lot. So um, go ahead. Yeah, I could just I can address hard soft because that's what I've done mostly, although maybe sprinkled in a little soft style. Um, most of my uh, kick punch arts have all my kick punch arts have been hard style. Uh, I I did study. Uh, hung guard kung fu for a while, but that's pretty much of a hard style. You know, it's yeah. real like the tiger claw and all this business. You know, uh, I really like that too. It's really good. I, unfortunately, I didn't get to study it very long, but um, and I have done tai chi. Uh, I learned three different forms and even taught it briefly for a while. And I really enjoyed how that the physicality of tai chi uh, connects with the mind. And when you're in the right place with it, how uh, it's they talk it. They call it moving meditation. One of my instructors said, "No, that's BS. Don't use uh, what it is to me. If you connect it with the breathing, if I would, in my case, if I connect it with the breathing, and I'm in a right mind frame, uh, it's exhilarating when I end the form how I feel afterwards, and I don't get that same exhilaration from doing a hard style kata. Um, so, the, so there, there's that. Um, so what I found over the years is that there's all kinds of definition of soft style. How do you define soft style? Is it like the chop sake movies, you know, where the guy goes like this and his little rays come out of his hand and, and wipes up, you know, the muck, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, or is it, uh, is it something else? Uh, in fact, last night I watched a bunch of phony uh, guys in, uh, in China doing chi stuff you know setting fires and all this stuff it's just yeah crazy yeah. sadly people buy into that but uh there was a guy i i, I was injured but i had i went to this the guy called me up and he he said I, I have this friend of mine who's coming to my house we're going to do a little mini seminar in my basement and about six or seven guys and i went but i was injured and i couldn't train this guy was an aikido guy middle-aged guy white beard the whole thing and he was a professor of mathematics, and he he applied mathematics. This is what he said. He applied mathematics to his movements. So he would have these guys. He'd never met these guys before. Grab his arm, grab his shoulder, and he would just do a slight nuance, just a nuance of some kind, just a shoulder dip. And the guy, they wouldn't go f flying off and staggering like they do in these phony clips we see on Facebook. Uh, but the guy would just he would lose his balance. He would shift his weight, it'd knock him off balance, he'd fall down on the ground. It was really quite amazing. Nothing mystical about it. Uh, he made it look mystical, but it was all, in his case, he called it mathematics applied. Uh, there's that. <clears throat> my wife reminded me of something this morning when I ran that question by her, and my wife's been training for over 20 years. And uh, I had a, she brought up, not too long ago, I had a student who uh, has an incredible roundhouse kick. And uh, he was over in the corner, and he was just whip, just smashing this bag. I think, if I remember right, another guy was holding it. And he was just making the two ends of the bag come together like that. It was just powerful. And uh, I said, uh, Dave, uh, not his real name, but Dave, uh, what are you doing with your abdominals? He goes, uh, nothing. What are you doing with your brain? He goes, uh, nothing. I said, try this. When your foot is about two inches from the bag, contract your abdominals. And as you, when your foot's about three or four inches from the bag, see the other side of the bag. Don't hit the surface. See the other side of the bag. And I talked to him just a little bit about how to put that all together, how to, how to connect that, how to get that flow. He took him maybe a dozen repetitions before he was doing it. Then he put it on a bag, and he was hitting the bag harder. I go, what'd you do? Take a protein shake when I wasn't looking, you know? He goes, no. I said, no, you applied your head to it. So I don't know if that can be a part of uh, the soft uh, internal style. There's a little bit of mental. He had to mentally apply his abs. He had to mentally see the other side of the target and not be disrupted by the surface of the bag right in front of him. You're better at that than I am, so. Well, I wouldn't say better, but it, you know, I, I've mainly trained in, in Chinese style, so, uh, and I've been doing Tai Chi Chuan for the past uh, 20 plus years. So it's, it's a little bit, um, I wouldn't say more, more th my thing, but uh, do have some experience with it. And I think it's exactly like you said. Um, 
how do you define soft and hard style? It, it becomes very, very murky very quickly because in my experiences, it, that is just, um, it's, a, it's, it's a continuum. It's not just like on the left, we've got soft style, on the right, we've got hard style. You mentioned Hungar. Okay, there's parts in hung, Hungar, which I think you could consider soft elements. Uh, some of the training that they do, it doesn't look like it from the outside, but I would I would say that it is. And then vice versa in the Tai Chi Chuan that I do, I'm a, I'm a bad example because I'm a heavyweight and I'm fairly muscular and everybody wants to see a small elderly Chinese guy do all this this amazing stuff. So I'm a bad, uh, a bad example anyway, but uh, some of the stuff that we do doesn't really look all that soft <laughs> when you punch somebody really hard in the ribs uh, try and, and that they break. But, so, you know, if you if you would have come to me years ago and said, what style should I take? I would have never recommended Kung Fu, the yeah. Chinese, because the way you're built. But you have you're there. I don't know if you're the exception or not, but you're fantastic. You know, I, I mentioned the other day on your site, I said your form is just always so beautiful, you know, and that form is important to apply what you're doing, you know. And so you're I think you're an exception to uh I've, I've seen a bunch of guys in, in Kung Fu, but then again, it's mostly the circles I run in. So I've seen a bunch of guys like that um, and, and that are that are even a lot better than I am. But like like my teachers, I mean, they, uh, they, they still beat me up if they want to. But the thing that I mainly see is that I think that that's a big part of it, the body mechanics. Um, and, and then it becomes really difficult to answer that because I still haven't really found a good definition of well, how are the body mechanics different in a soft, sort of call, so-called soft style versus a hard style. Um, becomes really complex. Uh, I, I would think that a big part of it is uh, the coordination of your body. And one of the principles of the style touch that I do is everything begins and ends at the same time. So let's say that if you have a movement where you've got um, five components to the movement, so you're going to uh, lower your left hand, push with your right hand, uh, transfer your weight forward, rotate your spine and lean into a front stance. All those things will start at the same time, but they also stop at the same time so that you create a lot of torque basically throughout your body and all that needs to be delivered into that palm strike that you're doing. I'm just giving an example. Well, if you look at those mechanics, they're not that unsimilar from uh, a karate reverse punch. There are also a lot of similarities in a boxing right cross, but there's a lot of differences as well. And and I think that's where the key point lies. And, and then it gets really, really detailed and murky. And again, we, we end back on that it's a continuum and that it's not just um you know either soft or a hard style but it, it's more a blend of certain things and sometimes a little bit more of this and sometimes a little bit more of that and then there's also the part of that well how skilled are you because uh, if right. you if you take somebody um and i put him in my title one class and in the very first class they're going to learn self defense techniques so uh, but his body mechanics are total crap because he's never done anything in his life and uh and he's just using all muscle well, is he doing a hard style all of a sudden then? Because he's he's not good at it yet at that point in time. So I I don't know. I think it's very very difficult to uh, to just put labels on 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 styles like that. Yeah, you could say that hard style is application, the proper application and timing of the delivery of a technique using all the proper applicable muscles. But in soft style, it's the same thing. But you're lining up all the skeletal system. Yeah, I think that's a part of it. Yeah, I would agree yeah. with that. Yeah, and and I, I liked um, a term that I really liked from uh, Chris Wilder. He called it stacking the bones, so that you're stacking everything correctly, so that it's a solid, solid structure, and that you're mainly using that structure to do your techniques as opposed to um, just simply a, a muscular effort, a, a muscle contraction. Like how fast can you contract your triceps so you so you, you you throw a straight punch? Well, that shouldn't be the issue. That that's a part of it, but that's not the issue. We um, in Tai Chi that we do, we have um, we make we distinguish between brute strength and trained strength. Brute strength is just uh, how much weight can you can you curl with your in with your bicep curl? How many pounds can you lift that way? How much can you bench press? It's it's important, but it's not the only thing. And then trained strength right. would be how effectively can you use that muscular strength in a technique 
because it's, it's not the same it's not the same thing as as, sure. as bench pressing exactly so, i got i got a couple of students one time they were in the air force we have an air force base here they were in the air force and they're both bodybuilders they could they could have done really well in a physique contest yeah. and they couldn't punch punch as hard as my young daughter at that time <laughs> uh because they didn't know how to use those muscles correctly exactly uh, after a couple three months they could punch harder than me you know because yeah. they had learned how to put all those muscles together and, and coordinate them correctly yeah yeah more things i think yeah i would agree that's a big part of it okay i think well well you know we gave it a try <laughs> i hope yeah. uh, i hope it's a good answer in other words we don't know so yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, pretty much um Jakob also had another question. He, he asked, what is the role, if any, of meditation in martial arts and self-defense training? Well, a lot of schools, you know, they start with a five minutes of meditation or whatever and sitting quietly. And I think the idea is to uh, shut out the, the outside world, turn off your day, you know, your high stress office job or your, your phys high stress your boss ripping into you, everything. Turn all that off and prepare for the training. Clear your mind for the training. That's a good idea. Most guys just sit there and they're probably thinking about something else. But the concept is a good one. Uh, to take it farther, uh, meditation as something that you do away from class, is, I believe in it 100%. I've written a couple of books on it, uh, Meditation for Warriors and um, Mental Imagery for warriors, the difference between imagery and visualization. Visualization, you're just seeing uh, whatever it is you want to do. With imagery, you're using all your senses to be involved in what you want to do. Um, and uh, so the idea is, is, to, is to find a quiet spot. Say you have an issue, let's, let's back up. Just say you have an issue, you're having trouble with, uh, sparring this guy in your class he's a brown belt and you're a green belt and he's tough nice guy but he's tough and you kind of freeze up every time you face this guy and against other green belts you're you're, you're a star but against this brown belt you you can't keep your feet under without falling down meditation could be very helpful there uh i'm not going to get into a whole program here because it's there are volumes written on it but what you do is you would follow uh look up online or get my books and follow the guidelines to get yourself into a meditative state when you get yourself into a calm um, meditative state where all your muscles are relaxed your mind is still you are receptive to suggestions if you're not in that meditative state, you're you're not as suggestive, and, and perhaps you're not suggestive at all. So you get yourself in this state, and you you start talking to yourself about this guy. You know, is this guy has he is he beating up people? Uh, no, he's a nice guy. He's very helpful. Uh, what's scaring you? Well, he has tattoos. Well, can the tattoos hurt you? Uh, no. He has big muscles. Does muscles hurt you? No. He has a brown belt. So. You know, so all that stuff, you start looking at that rationally and you go, well, what's the worst can happen? Well, he's going to score on me. Yeah. Does he hit you extra hard? Well, yeah, a little bit, but I learned from that. Uh, so he's hitting you with control. So you're learning, uh, you're learning uh, when you get hit, you learn those parts of your body are open. So you're learning to, to cover yourself better. Can you ask him for help? If you're not delivering a technique, you can't get this technique of yours that works so well and everybody else in on him. Can you ask him for suggestions? Sure. So all these things you self talk to yourself and you talk yourself eventually, it doesn't happen in one setting. You talk yourself out of that uh, fear unwarranted fear of this guy who's actually a, a pretty good guy you know it could be very helpful and help your growth there's other things you can have a ton of different issues in your life that meditation helps you with if you need to just get calm get relaxed and you can just use that by itself you're if you're an agitated person you're always kind of wired and you're jumpy and you don't sleep well meditation helps you turn on that calmness one of the things you do with meditation is once you get into that suggestive state you give yourself i call it a keyword and the keyword you know, use a word that you don't hear very often don't use the word the you know use a word you don't hear very often my middle name is wayne i don't know anybody named wayne so i use wayne and so i get myself in this meditative state and i just whisper or say it to myself wayne 
and I go deeper. Once you, you, you to set that keyword, you tell yourself, I am going to, whenever I whisper or utter or say to myself that keyword, it's going to um, sink me deeper into my meditative state where I where I'm highly suggestible. Uh, and when I say that word, when I'm functioning throughout the day, it's going to relax me to some degree, not as not as profoundly as when you're meditating in a quiet place, but to some degree. And I use it all the time on a police job. I'd, I'd be going on a hot call. It sounds stupid. And I won't I don't want you to tell anybody, but I would just kind of say that middle name or sometimes I used um, sink, S-I-N-K, sink. I'm sinking my whole self into a state of relaxation. And I would go from 100 to maybe 75. Much better to function at 75 than it is at 100. You know, when you meditate, you get right down here to maybe 15 or 20. Um, I don't know why I'm doing these hand gestures. You can't see them very well. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, it can be used for a host of things. And, and the books, and, and there's other books out there uh, that tell you how to use how to use meditation for issues in your relationships, at your work, um, any issues you have, uh, personal issues. Uh, and the next question is about a guy has uh, problems with his rage, uh, all kinds of things. And um, it's a powerful, powerful thing because you're what you, what's happening is you're reprogramming your subconscious to these positive things. You're you're overtaping the negative stuff. That's it in kind of a sloppy nutshell, but it's much more. No, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and I'm going to put um, the links to your, your two books, uh, the Meditation for Warriors and the, and the Mental Imagery book. Um, I'll put the link in the show notes so that people can can get that. And and I highly recommend it because I read them both and they're really good. So um, everybody get 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 those books. Um, all right. So, and like you said, there's a there's a follow up question uh, from somebody else, uh, also um, a patron of mine, Weaver Lindemann, and he asked how to deescalate oneself, uh, how to stop <laughs> one's inner asshole. <laughs> I think inner a asshole. lot of people need that <laughs> need that advice, given how much you know bullshit that we see uh, see happening in the world. <laughs> yeah, or what better yet, but how to how to stop this guy's inner you know? <laughs> So, um, yeah, it, we talked about there's a there's that old there's a famous um, story about a Comanche um, American Indian who was talking to his son. He said, "Son, within every person there are two wolves, a an evil wolf and a good wolf." And the, the evil is angry and he's depressed and he's hostile and he's quick to temper. The, the good wolf is pleasant, positive, upbeat, mellow. He's in control of himself. And his son says, which one wins? And the father says, the one you feed. So if you feed this inner asshole, you're going to get inner asshole actions from it. Uh, meditation is a powerful well, the first thing that's in your in in your favor is that you recognize that self that's that issue with yourself. A lot of people don't recognize it, or they ignore it, or they they brag about it. Yeah, you this guy pushes me, man. I'm going to rip his head off. Uh, it's kind of hard to deal with those kind of guys. Uh, but if you recognize it yourself, and clearly you want to do something about it, um, there's lots of things you can do. It meditation helps. Uh, self talk helps. Uh, the power of the word stop. Uh, I should have read up a little bit more. We talk about stop in, in one of the uh, books that I did with a police psychologist. And when you start getting these negative thoughts, you literally say out loud, if you're by yourself, not if you're you know, in a crowd, you stop. And it has a powerful uh, uh, ability to stop that thought, maybe just for a second or two, but just for a second, you now you have a little control over it. You start coming back. I'm going to, this guy's pissing me off. This guy, this road rage, you know, you're in a road rage situation. He just, how dare him cut me off. I should be in front of the line. You know, he's going to get there two seconds before I do. That's not right. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, it just stop, stop. In your meditation, you would, <clears throat> you would, uh, meditate on this and when you meditate on something you get in this deep this deep state of relaxation 
uh, and you take this issue, I have an issue of exploding rage, and you, when you're in a deep meditative state, you're not cluttered with, in, in meditation, they call it the monkey brain, <clears throat> excuse me, with brain just going all over the place. And it's hard to think when your brain's going all over the place. You've had that at night when you're trying to sleep and you go, dee, 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 dee. Uh, most of it doesn't even make sense if you're like me. Uh, but when you're in a clear, calm, meditative state, you can look at this issue and you can begin to see what that issue is to you, what, what triggers that issue, what you can do to control that issue. One of the things you can do is create an image of prison because if you let that inner asshole go, good chance you're going to end up going <laughs> to prison, you yep. know. And as Mark McYoung says, you're going to be taking showers with heavily tattooed guys, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and just think of what's the repercussions if I don't learn to control my inner rage. You can control it. And you have to look at how can I control it. You may have to even talk to a psychologist or something about it. But uh, meditation will go a long ways toward towards helping you uh, Help you control that. Uh, I, had, I had an issue early on uh, on the police department. I would kind of take violations as a personal affront to me. You know, somebody commit a crime or a violation, I take it as a a personal affront, and which is stupid. But I was doing it, and uh, and sometimes I'd grab people and and maybe to be a little too rough on them. Uh, and when I started just I said, I'd go home and I started thinking about it, the risk I was taking of not only my job, a livelihood at that time, <clears throat> I was risking reputation, reputation lawsuits, uh, a reputation getting my partner in trouble because he's with me what he's, when I'm doing that. There's so, and, and then if you're not in law enforcement, you got the, your, your own personal reputation, what can happen to you, your family, lawsuits. It's insane nowadays, at least in the United States, it's, it's litigation society now. You sneeze wrong, somebody wants to sue you. So you have to be really careful. You need to get a control of that. Meditation is a powerful tool to use to help. That's, that's great. Yeah, it's really great advice. And, and, and I, I uh, agree with pretty much everything that you just said. And I would advise we would take it at heart. Um, as 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 you know, because we've talked about that so many times in the past, and and maybe some listeners do, but not not everybody does. I have a temper, I, and it's a it's a pretty impressive one. <laughs> so, and I've always had it as a child. Uh, my mom told me that I would just start stomping the floor out of anger. I couldn't couldn't handle myself. It's always been there. It's still there. I'm almost 47. It didn't go away. What did change is that I learned when I was about 18, I decided that, okay, so you can go you, one of two ways. You can turn into this asshole who beats people up uh, because you're strong and you do martial arts and, you, and you'll be good at that, but you're going to end up in jail or you can start working on yourself, which is what I did. And it's come to the point where nowadays um, there's there's a lot of people who've known me for for, for oh, well over a decade or even longer, and they don't believe me when I when I tell them that I have a temper. I said, look, it's still there. <laughs> I just learned to control it a lot better. And nowadays, nowadays, it takes quite a bit to uh, for it for it to come out. And the trick that I think that helped a lot, you know, on top of all the techniques that you mentioned, because I I work with a bunch of those myself, is um, distinguishing between your your temperament and your personality because they're not the same. My temperament is very volatile. So I'm quick to anger. My personality is something else. That is who I am as a person. And what I try to do is then, okay, so if I know that I'm quick to anger, I need to develop a personality where in which patience and understanding is a big part of it. Because that is going to counteract my instinctive response to uh, to just just get really angry at people for for sometimes really, really stupid stuff. And that helped a lot. That helped a lot. You know, it, uh, I used to go to San Francisco throughout the 80s, and I do I go down about every three months, and I do articles on guys. There's a whole mecca of martial arts down there, and I do articles on guys for the magazines, either technique or personality pieces. And I befriended um, Rick Olimani, Professor Rick Olimani, who's a, a tenth don in Kempo. I think he lives in Hawaii now. And uh, a thing he taught me, we we're on the freeway, and he was driving, and he was driving like he was sparring. 
and just, you know, faking it card, cutting in lanes, and everybody else was doing the same thing. If you've driven in San Francisco, it's, it's, a, it's a terrifying freeway. And I said, Rick, I said, how do you keep from just pulling over and yanking one of these guys out of the car and just beating the tar out of him? And he goes, he, he was really surprised I even thought of that question because obviously it hadn't occurred to him. And he said, because I don't make him that important to me. The guy at, at Motors is only in my life for 30 seconds, maybe a little longer. If I pull him out and beat him up, maybe he'll shoot me. Yeah. Or maybe I'll kill him. Or maybe I'll beat him. To, and he got all these cars, you got all these witnesses. And I just made this guy really, really important in my life. And with courts and trials and lawsuits, this guy's going to be in my life for a long, long time. And uh, it's not worth it. For what, you know, just because he pissed me off for a second. And it's the same uh, any place, you know, somebody, this guy deliberately banged into my wife's uh, grocery cart the other day. Big fat guy, one of his guys that leads with his stomach, you know, it's kind of, uh, and uh, I, I started to reach for him and your wife said, don't. And I go, you're right, don't make this, just went down a different aisle. I'm not gonna make this fat pig uh, that, <laughs> that important <laughs> to me. You know, I'm just going to make it that important to me. Just move on. And he's out of my life. And uh, clearly he's still there. So he's sort of important. But I didn't make him real, real important by, you know, <laughs> making him bleed. So, yep. Great. Okay. Well, moving on to uh, the next question. That one's from Brad Meng. And Brad asks, martial arts training gives you more options than what your police training gives you for hands-on situations. Do you ever have an issue where the right move was one that wasn't allowed by your PD? Yeah, all the time. Um, we, uh, yeah, eye gouges, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> groin rips, that sort of thing. No, um, the basis of the, I taught defensive tactics uh, to our police department for 24 of my 25 years, then taught police agencies all over the place <clears throat> and written on it quite a bit. And the basis of police work is control, to control the bad guy. You control him by leverage or you control him by pain. By having that goal, you ultimately control yourself as well. You don't get these, these uh, moments where you see in some of these clips where the cop just goes crazy on some guy punching him out or something. Uh, <clears throat> so all of our techniques are based on control. There's millions of techniques. Uh, when I taught defensive tactics, I, th I think I taught about nine, nine different techniques. But we looked at, a, 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 say, a, a, a Sankyo technique, wrist twist yeah. technique. We looked at that in a host of ways, a variety of ways to apply that. Getting a guy out of a car, getting a guy up uh, who refuses to get up off the ground, taking a guy down to the ground with it, uh, walking a guy taking that wrist and maneuvering into a place to handcuff him. So we look at it uh, in a variety of ways, which increases the officer's understanding, and he sees the utility of using this in a, in a host of, of places. We do that in karate training, too, and in jiu-jitsu training. We, we, okay, you got, a, you got their straight punch, cross punch, jab, whatever. <clears throat> How many other places can you do it? The more places you can do it, the more it's there for you, if you don't practice that on your back, how do you know it's going to be there for you in that situation? Uh, using it in a variety of angles, not only is that good to know you don't, you can, you can punch more than just straight forward. You can punch off to the side. You can punch up. You do all these things. The side benefit of that is you develop your muscles more completely than just always throwing it forward. You know that sort of thing. So. Um, so we take these techniques and we apply these techniques to the basic principle of control. So there were times I would do, say, uh, my, one of my go-to techniques was uh, a neck hook. If you, I don't know if you can see that, you're, well, you do it in your video, outstanding video, get that video, uh, but you do a kind of a face palm or forehead palm. Uh, yeah. I like to hook the neck, uh, hook the neck and you kind of get a little pop against the Adam's apple there, lift your elbow, and he goes down. And you take a step through, or you just, uh, I like to shuffle forward with the lead foot and take the guy down. <clears throat> uh, that's That wasn't something that I taught, but it was something I really liked because when everything else was messy, I could go right for that neck hook, get the guy down, then kind of start over. 
you can't tell the bad guy, hold it, let's start over. Okay? You, know, you can't do that. So, uh, so, but the neck hook fit uh, the primary goal of control. It, it took the guy down. I could then grab his arm. Jack him, put, you yank him by his wrist, apply pressure on his elbow, roll him over onto his stomach, and put him in handcuffs. And once in a while, I get a, a class with me, a, like a wrestler or a, some jujitsu guy. And he would say, what about this? And he would tie the guy up and he'd make a, a sailor proud with all these knots and twists. And the guy's got one hand going off here, another hand way over there, and his foot twisted around. And I goes, great. I said, now handcuff him. And the yep. guy goes. What you know? <laughs> you got a handcuff. You got a handcuff and we'll walk because we got to get him under control. Then you got to take him under control to the car, get him out of the car, take him into the jail or into the courthouse or wherever. Uh, it's a great technique, but not if you're going to handcuff him. So, um, so my answer to this question, if this guy's question is, I'm assuming he's a policeman. If you have techniques that apply to that, usually what happens when you write your report and you, and you use force, you say, I used a bureau approved. <laughs> uh, a technique and you want to be specific I use a, a wrist lock a bureau approved wrist lock technique uh, so and when you write your report using something else to say I used a a, uh, a technique that uh, is applicable to the bureau concept of control pain control or leverage control that's where I would do it I never got yeah. you know 25 years I never got an extreme I never got an internal affairs uh, complaint for extreme force and I use it a lot. I use it a lot. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. And uh, Brad had a follow-up question. He says, uh, today's standards uh, in police departments seem even more restrictive. Do you have any advice for young officers that also train in the martial arts? Not other than and just uh, what I said. Uh, look at some techniques. Find techniques that you, you really like. Why do you like them? Because you probably do them well. Usually you don't like techniques you don't do well, you know. So if this, uh, and it's not too over the top, it's not too, uh, um, I don't want to say flamboyant, but that really makes people look, you know, uh, at you, especially everybody's the cell phone, you know, trying to get a little clip to sell to the news stations. Um, uh, find a technique that's subtle, low keyed, uh, that you really, really like, but it fits your basic concept of controlling the person through leverage or pain compliance. How much pain does it get? However much he resists. If he doesn't resist very much, he doesn't get any pain, but you hold, but you maintain the technique. So if suddenly he does, a lot of people change mind. You know, you, all of a sudden you're walking into the car, you're walking into the jail, they change their mind or their buddies aren't around them, the bravado is gone. I don't want to go there and they start resisting. If you're just starting from scratch, you got a whole nother fight. But if you already have a hold of this guy in a control hold, you supply the hold, just by pressure with the hold. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, moving on to the next question, and that one is from uh, Craig Jenkins. And Craig asks, "How do you convey how it feels? The activity itself is one thing, but how it actually feels to hit and to be hit. To me, that seems to be the most challenging." Um, beyond picking fights. Yeah. <laughs> well. Um, one thing, if I understand the question right, um, uh, an exercise we do, and, and you may do it, is we hit each other. Uh, we'll take a, we'll take a drill. Like if I'm facing you, and uh, I'm going to throw a roundhouse kick at your at your leg, I'm not letting you kick me. <laughs> no way. Anyway, so I kick you to the leg. You respond with a counter. You don't block it. You don't try to evade it. You just respond with a counter. Uh, so I get the I get the benefit of the feel of what it feels like to hit you at about 25 percent, 20 percent, whatever, somewhere in there. You get the benefit of not freaking out. Oh, I got hit. But you respond immediately with a counter and you can move. And then it's your turn. You hit me 10 times each time I respond with a counter. It gets to be kind of fun. And pretty soon you kind of get an ornery and you're smacking each other. You, you jacked it up to about 30%, you know, 40%. You're hitting each other pretty good. Uh, and you can move it up to body shots. They throw, a, uh, you know, a cross punch in your um, a chest. Uh, you, these are targets that aren't going to debilitate. You're not going to hit somebody 50% in a solar plexus, you know, but in the chest where you feel that hard, boom, that impact it makes a big, loud thump, feel that thump, and you respond immediately by just, bam, you counter right back. 
that's your response to getting hit. You counter back. Uh, and with the face, glove up with your, your especially soft gloves, and you smack each other. Uh, we never go to the nose or the eye or the mouth or anything, but the side of the head, the forehead, back of the head. We hit each other, and hard enough for the guy to go, Bleh. you know, his eyes do a slot machine thing there for a second, and but he immediately counters. He counters. So both benefit. The, the hitty benefits by seeing what it feels like, and it's not the end of the world to get hit, and that he immediately responds. Uh, and then the hitter sees what it feels like to actually hit a human body. We do the same thing in Arnis. I've done this for a long time, but when I was first taking Arnis, we'd grip the stick, and with the other hand holding a stick, we'd whack the back of our hand. And it's what you want to do is you want to fight that counter counterintuitiveness to Bop, open your hand, and you lose your weapon. Instead, we'd hit the hand, and we'd tighten the fist. We'd do that over and over, each hand, and some classes we'd end, we'd have these little half walnuts sitting on the back of our hand. <laughs> but we, what, when we were really going at it with the stick flailing, getting hit on the hand, nobody lost their stick. They just, if, if anything, probably even unconsciously after a while, they tighten their grip on the stick. Okay, yep. That's, that's a really good answer, and, and and I think we need to emphasize that you said like thirty percent, twenty percent. Yeah, yeah. You did you did not say three hundred no, or anything like yeah. that, because yeah. there's always people who they're like, oh, this is a great thing. Let let yeah. let's crank it up a little bit more. Uh, yeah. No, well, no. Some of you black belts are going to do that. That's okay. It's kind of fun, you know, as long as nobody gets killed or anything. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, next question from. Uh, Joseph Killian, and uh, he actually has a, has a good joke that I, that I wanted to add. And it says, uh, "You so you've been recently promoted to 10th Dan, so congratulations on that. Thank you. And uh, Joseph wanted to know if that now is going to uh, make you rise up in the list of Black Belt Magazine of the 20th, 20 toughest men alive. Yes, it will. Of. Yes, it you're will. Gonna, no. Number one, of course. <laughs> no. You know, thankfully, no, I, he says 15 years ago, it, it seems less 15, than that. Maybe, a part of, yeah, uh, yeah, like maybe, that. yeah, maybe it was. Did I lose you? You still got me? No, yep, yep. Got okay. You. Crazy for a second. Yeah, uh, okay. First of all, that wasn't my fault. I didn't want it to happen. Uh, <laughs> a couple of guys, uh, a couple of guys in, in Los Angeles, uh, one was a Gracie Jiu Jitsu teacher and the other was a LA cop who also did uh, jiu-jitsu and was a nationally ranked wrestler and uh, I don't know they had some connection with black belt and they must have known this was happening this list and they put my name in there black belt did whatever they did I didn't know about it all of a sudden one day I heard about it and I go what <laughs> no 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 I mean I gonna have these gunslingers coming to my house you know and so I immediately called up uh Black Belt Magnet, Robert Young, I think was the, I think he's still the publisher. I may be wrong about that. I called him and I said, take my name off the list. This is crazy. You know, at first it's a stupid thing anyway. And yeah. then, and then, and then, uh, and there's no way is it even remotely clear. I, 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 after when that came out, I would tell guys, I'm the toughest guy at my dad's rest home. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but anyway, Robert Jenkins said it's it's too late. It's already at the publisher. And I go, oh, geez. and it came out and it wasn't that bad. You know, some of my friends gave me a lot of crap about it. And uh, they said, well, you're number 14. I go, wait a minute. That's it's in no particular order. I'd, all of a sudden I find myself defending, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's that's kind of gone to the used magazine stores. And I haven't heard anything about it in a long time until uh, your friend here. Thanks a lot. So. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, uh, Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. <laughs> Lauren says thanks. Joseph, uh. <laughs> well, he actually did have a real question, and, and his question is um, to ask you for advice on preventative uh, maintenance for people who want to train martial arts their whole life. Uh, take it easy. Uh, years ago, I got into bodybuilding way back in the late 70s, and uh, the guy who owned the gym was a former Mr. America, and he told me the secret to longevity is don't lift so heavy. Find out ways to make the weight heavy by leverage and angles and dangles and that sort of thing, and I've always done that. And I'm still lifting weights. I'm 72 years old now, and uh, I'm still lifting weights, and all the guys I trained with all walking around, you know, all hunched up and bad this and that, and joints who did the super wide benches and the wide pull downs and all that stuff that we know are, 
are not a good idea that hazardous to your joints. So, so take it easy. Take it easy for the weights. You can still get big if you, and you still get strong, but you don't have to do this tremendous poundage. Uh, that's with weights. With the martial arts, uh, take care of your joints. Uh, I, get, I hate to keep plugging this, but I have a book called Solar Training for 50 Years Old and Over. Uh, and uh, it's for there's lots of techniques that guys younger can do so that they can stay training forever, you know, right up to their 90 and fall over in a pile. But uh, in, in my case, I still train three times a week. I don't train like I did when I was 30 and 40. I don't train like I did when I was in competition, but I still train pretty hard and, uh, and lift weights three days a week, have one day off, uh, mainly because I just take it easy. If my joints, if my knees starting to act up, I take it easy with it. I either don't do whatever kick is making it hurt. Uh, um, I always try not to extend all the way with the punches, with the kicks, uh, because then you really, you really stress that joint. You only got that one joint. You only get that one knee joint on that right leg. You only get that in the left. So uh, take it easy with your joints. Everything's in moderation. Go moderate. Can you, but can you train hard and go moderate? Sure. Yeah, you just push yourself. You find out what, um, I'm a strong believer in repetitions. Uh, I still am after all these years. That's That was my roots and I still am. That doesn't mean you got to sit in a horse and just pound out punch after punch. Up. There's a there's a hundred ways you can get your repetitions in that aren't so hard on your joints. Uh, figure out ways to do that. Uh, everything from weights to hitting the bag, soft bags, heavy bags, uh, somebody resisting your punch, all these kinds of things to get your repetitions in. Um, so that's a quick, short answer. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll I'll put a link in the show notes on the uh, on the solo right. training book for fifty years and and, and older. All yeah, right. I, I don't mean to be plugging books. I don't like that. I don't want to be that guy. But no, but it's it's there. there. I, I mean, um, you, you, the reason why I say that is is because um, you've you've written sixty plus books now, and a lot of the 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 questions that you're answering right now, uh, if if people buy the book, they're going to get a, a full book about pretty much nothing but that. Yeah. So it's a it's a more complete answer than than that you can give on uh, on the interview here, um, and and people just should just buy you buy your your books and because oh. next time I, I visit you I want I want that ride in the rolls, so uh, sure. yeah I'm saving up for rolls right now I have <laughs> enough money for the ash trade. Oh, well there you so. go. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we've got two more questions from uh, Som Gupta and Som asks, will there be a second edition or a republishing of your book Deadly Force Encounters? Now that sounds like a plant question, but I didn't know <laughs> what about it. Uh, it's number I, nine on the list. Yeah. I'm just reading reading the list. So, um, yeah, in 1996, I think it was, uh, Deadly Force Encounters came out. It was a book I wrote uh, with police psychologist, uh, Dr. Alexis Artwall. She's an amazing woman who's been training cops um, and treating cops for her whole life. And uh, this book addresses what happens. The book is now out of print because uh, Paladin Press closed shop and uh, uh, the book is no longer in print. You can get it used places, but I can't buy it. I can't buy a rolls if you buy it used. But anyway, uh, so the book addresses how do you prepare mentally for a deadly force encounter? Use this with a gun. It could be something else. Uh, how do you survive it as it's happened mentally? And the worst of those three of the three is how do you survive the aftermath? And the app for cops, if the aftermath could be lawsuits, the police agency turns against him if uh, if the enough squeaky wheels in the community uh, squeak their wheels, you know, and turn against him, lawsuits. Uh, if there's some perception that you you acted outside of bureau policy, the bureau is not going to supply you an attorney. So it may cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to get out of this lawsuit, that sort of thing. The second book. So when I, I contacted her uh, about a year ago and I said, uh, what do you want to do with this book? You want to republish it? Or want to do? She said, I want to write a new one. And at first I thought she wanted to just add on to this. But uh, ends up, it's uh, we've been working out now for about six months. It's going to be Deadly Force Encounters 2. Uh, but it's going to have very little of the previous stuff, and it's going to be aimed at two audiences. Uh, and this, this is, I think, where a lot of your your audience uh, would be interested: uh, police officers and people who carry a concealed weapon, 
more and more people are doing that nowadays. Or if you don't actually carry one, you keep one by the door. I can't, I have a Glock by my door and a 38 by my dresser and a shotgun down here in the office. If my six pound dog can't stop him. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so it's, and again, it's, uh, more information, new, new, um, studies has been 22 years on what happens through the mind, how you can overcome those, those natural, uh, phenomena that happens through the brain. Um, such thing as audio exclusions, uh, the narrowing of the vision, uh, all these kinds of things, uh, little, um, uh, things that happen to your brain under extreme stress, your inability to, to, uh, you lose your fine motor control, that sort of thing. Uh, and again, as it happens so that you're not, so that you recognize you're right in the middle of something. You recognize these things that are happening to you and you're okay with it because you know that you've read about it and you've thought about it. And then the aftermath, um, there's lots of, lots of stories, uh, war stories in it that support, uh, the various chapters to include, um, lots of incidents where carry concealed weapons, uh, civilians have, have saved lives and saved police officers' lives too when they've been overwhelmed or shot and wounded and that sort of thing. So it's uh, this is really uh, some fantastic. She's uh, an amazing person, and um, some of the chapter. What happens is she sends me a chapter. I edit it for uh, to make it uh, you know look good in the book, and then I add my ten cents worth. Sometimes it's only like two cents worth, uh, and then I'm I've written a couple of chapters or added added material to chapters. Um, but some of the stuff she sends is just, it's really mind blowing. Um, some of the stuff that they've come up with that answers a lot of questions, why people do things in a, under extreme, in a toxic environment of a, of a deadly uh, force uh, incident. Okay. Do you have an idea when uh, that, that second volume will come out? Um, I, I'm hoping for the spring. Uh, we kind of got slowed down because she was giving lectures all around the country. And now she's done with that. And uh, okay. she told me this week, she, I kind of expected something uh, this week. She's really going to start throwing me the chapters and, uh, and uh, they will really start humping it. So, so I'm working on that. And then I'm working on this little short story called Cato. So. Okay, great, great. Sounds great. Um, so I'm had another question. He says, he asked, um, as Lauren has so much experience in dealing with violence, what were his starting altercations like? And throughout the years, how did he cope with them? What were the main similarities and differences between them all? So what is it? What was it like in the beginning? And and what what is it later on when you were uh, a lot more experienced? Well, my first taste of police work was in was in uh, Saigon, Vietnam, and for the first year, and it just started out with a bang. And I had no idea. We, you know, we learned some judo in MP in military police school, which was worthless. So I just relied on my karate. Excuse me. And um, I guess I was sort of shocked that, well, I'm a military policeman. I got the MP letters on my shoulder and my MP helmet. You should obey me. Ninety-eight uh, percent of the time, they didn't. And, more, and this is a war zone. Everybody's either, uh, you know, uh, wired and everybody's got a gun. Everybody's got knives. Uh, and in town, in the city, they're all in, in brothels. They're all in um, bars. They're, they're drunk. Uh, they're combative already. And the fighting was just biblical. I mean, it was huge. And <clears throat> I started out with... At first, I was just what they call third man. I was a guy in the back of the Jeep answering the radio, uh, and my my two senior partners took care of it. Uh, but at, once after, they thrashed around in the mud and dirt, got back in all soaking wet and filthy, and I'm all clean in the back seat. They decided that I was going to be involved, and then after that, I, I just got involved in it, and and um, it was common to be in a half dozen uh, of fights a shift. And more when I started doing a walking beat. I got picked for this walking beat because of my martial arts. I was actually the smallest uh, military policeman. And there were eight of us in a walking beat, just walking uh, in like two columns. It was pretty, it was pretty bizarre. And uh, we just fought. And we fought from the beginning of the shift to the end of the shift. I got sick of it. I got tired of it. My fingers are all bent and twisted. I was, uh, just tired of being hurt and, and, and just having to do that to fellow American troops, you know. Um, so to answer the question, um, I and um, 
I probably wasn't that terribly introspective. I was young uh, in the army at that time. I wasn't that introspective and I was wanting to do what I was doing. Uh, and I didn't see certain commonalities. Uh, what I did recognize was that a situation could go from calm to all out fighting in a nanosecond from zero to hundred. The guy would be stiff uh, or he'd be still. We're telling him he's going with us. Uh, and he would just explode. And then chairs and tables would overturn. We'd all be in a big pile. Um, in the 60s, they called it a pig pile. You know, everybody called cops pigs. And the same with the uh, civilian police department. And it'd just be this huge melee. Uh, and so once I got on the police department, then I started refining things. And that's when I started learning grappling techniques to... Um, developed this system of, of, of controlling people. Um, so it was the same thing. Uh, sometimes the fight would start while I'm facing the guy and he's still slightly out of reach. And other times it would start once it took a hold of him. Uh, so if I took a hold of him, you could usually feel it in the body. Two things, either the guy would, now in a civilian set, uh, setting, it'd be you're, you've got a hold of a guy, maybe going for some kind of control, wrist lock control, you're trying to control this, uh, this guy. The body either goes slack, maybe he's an experienced fighter, he's relaxing himself before he suddenly explodes, or he tenses in anticipation of exploding. Sometimes he'll pull away, sometimes he'll push into you. You need to be ready for both. That's why footwork and balance is so important. Uh, it's real easy for a guy to take you down on the ground if you're if you're standing in a stance that's not staggered. Uh, if you're standing, say, two legs facing the guy. I talk about the invisible third leg. You're weakest with that. If you were tripod where that third leg is, you're, that's where you're weakest. If he shoves you with his shoulder in that direction, you're going to either stumble or you're going to go down. So uh, you you figure out how to stagger yourself to to anticipate this sudden change of mindset with this guy. Other times, uh, if you're just facing the guy, he may be uh, kind of nodding. He's okay, I understand what you're saying. Uh, sure, I'm going to jail. I never really told a guy he was going to jail until once I got hands on. But sometimes a guy could read my intent or our intent by the other officers there, and then he would act. He would explode. He uh, he would turn using the shoulders turn. You probably teach your students. You watch the shoulders. That's where you can tell where a guy's got a punch. He's going to kick. You can watch the shoulder. If the guy starts to turn, he's either going to kick or he's going to rabbit. He's going to run. Uh, if he turns way around, he's going to run. So you want to latch on to him. Uh, if he suddenly tenses, lowers the head, uh, looks off to the side a little bit. I call that the German Shepherd stare. That is a real bad thing to happen. <laughs> when, <laughs> if the guy, the guy, I'm looking, I think I'm looking at you right now, right? If yeah. I'm looking at you and all of a sudden I start looking off to the side here, maybe the eyes narrow and they get a little tension in the face. This guy's in a zone. I, I never really found anything that works that well. When that guy gets into that zone, you just got to jump on him and do your stuff on him. You can't talk him out of there. You can't say, Listen, Bob, you know, you need to calm down, <laughs> calm down, calm down never works on anybody. It's, it's got to be a hands on. I call that the German Shepherd stare because if you've ever faced down a dog and that dog turns to the side, uh, you know, your ass is, is, is in bad shape. So, um, so that's a real clear motive. The tension, agitation, the opening and closing of the fists as they hang down at his side. Uh, the, uh, the eyes darting around, he's getting ready to run. Uh, maybe he's checking you out. If he's looking, he's looking you up and down. Is he really fascinated with your crotch? Or is he thinking about kicking you? Is, is he really fascinated with your face? Or is he thinking about punching you there? So just little, sometimes they're very overt, really big motions. Sometimes they're real subtle and you have to read that. One, one thing you can do to help if you, if you haven't had a lot of experience is, is go watch YouTube, uh, watch cops. One time, sometimes I, I never deliberately watch cops. I don't know what channel it's on, but if I come across it, I usually watch it and I'll tell my wife, okay, this guy's going to run. The cop's <laughs> not reading it. He's not reading it. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to run. And boom. Sure enough, he takes off or he's going to go for a tackle. 
The cop's not paying attention. He's going to go for a tackle. Boom, he shoots in. Um, that sort of thing. Or, or the, uh, you post tons of those videos, and they're all yeah, excellent yeah. for reading people. Especially look up a keyword sucker punch. That's always a good one. See what a guy does before he delivers that punch. Look at his body language. And train that way in class. Train that way in class. Have your opponent kind of look away and then, boom, come back with that punch. Yep. What are you going to do? And as you talk about in your video, have those hands up already. Yep. It's a lot easier from going from here to being in your pocket. Yep. You know? Muhammad Ali learned that the hard way. You know, He always had his hands down, and then it came to a point where he was facing some tough guys. And I'm convinced how he got his brain to him, where he got his brain damage from you know, having his hand down, doing all this and taking those shots, you know, should have been up here, you know, checking those, checking those shots. So, yeah, no, I think also, again, and I'm going to plug the book for you, but um, your latest one, Street Lessons, A Journey. I think that that's a really great book that answers in, uh, in, in, in extensive detail. Basically, what, what uh, Som just asked is, is because you, you describe how you started with your training, both in martial arts and then uh, beginning in law enforcement in, in Vietnam during the war. And also, um, you know, later on in your career as a police officer. And, and you, you have several chapters in which that at the end you just say, okay, right. So these are some of the lessons that I learned. And, and it's all just practical stuff, practical yeah. tips. So I'm, I'm going to put a, a link in the show notes to that book. And, and I'm almost done reading it. So uh, I, from from what I what I've read, I, I think that's that is definitely one that some or anybody else who wants to know about that kind of stuff uh, definitely check out that book because uh, it's going to help big time. Very practical Thank uh, you. advice. Both those books, um, Street Lessons to Journey and Police Saigon's Saigons, are autobiographies, and they were done because of requests from people. And I was I tell people now that you can never have enough bullets. Or autobiographies about yourself. So <laughs> I'm done with the autobiographies. I, I, I never want to write the word I or me again. I'm tired, I'm sick, tired of myself. But so those are done. Those are, are out there and, and people seem to like them. So yeah, they do. Um, we've gone through the list. So now I get to ask questions. So Lauren, so you've got the Deadly Force Encounters book that you're working on. So that should come out hopefully in a, in a couple of months. Um, and you mentioned a short story, Cato. Can you talk a little bit about that, or is that too soon? Um, yeah, Cato. Um, Cato is a, a Buddhist monk. It's it's very, it's a very convoluted story, and that's part of the problem I'm having. I'm having. He's a convoluted monk who discovers that he's reincarnated from a killer. Nice. And <laughs> and, and uh, this killer has a way to sort of uh, inhabit him. Briefly, uh, I, it's either going to be called Cato, comma, comma, Mr. Karma, or Cato with a tagline, uh, they call him Mr. Karma. And so what Cato does is when he strikes out at people, it's because that people had it coming. Nice. And, uh, and he's trying to control that. And there's lots of fights in it. And it's real, real complicated. I had to do a lot of research on reincarnation. Whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, a lot of people do. And uh, saw some fantastic uh, videos and, and uh, read a lot of fantastic stuff on reincarnation. But so it's just touched on that lightly. And the problem he has dealing with that and the guilt he has from it because he can't control it. Yeah. Nice. And and beyond that, is there anything maybe in a tentative stage that you can talk about or uh, um, other books or project that you have planned? Um, well, uh, we're currently uh, finalizing uh, um, Policing Saigon. It's going to be an audio. I got okay. contacted by a publisher a few months ago, a couple of months ago, wanted to do it as an audio book. I'm not reading it, thank goodness. And they got an actor. They sent me, they have 300 actors in their in the publishing firm and they sent me uh two and i settled on the second guy the second guy's fantastic he has been an actor in movies and television and fantastic reader because this book has a whole range of emotions in it and humor and vietnamese accents and that sort of thing so so that's uh i think that's going to be out in the spring also and it's going to be weird well it's trying to struck me after i settled the deal we made the the, the contract and everything that this guy's going to be reading stuff that came out of my head about my experiences. And it's just kind of bizarre to kind of 
wrap my little head around that thing. And um, so it's going to be kind of weird. Uh, yeah. Other than that, um, I like that. I haven't tried the novella, so I'm doing the, the novella. I want to see how that works. I don't make a lot of money on the short stories, but they help my growth as a yeah. writer. I'm always looking for, for a biography. You're talking to a guy, and I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but here's a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, uh, Desert Storm, and Afghanistan, and was shot down three times. And it has quite a story, but I right now I'm thinking that's not going to happen. I'd like yeah. to write about somebody else for once. And, and, uh, and, uh, well, I've, I, I've got I, an idea for you. Um, uh, John Blooming just passed away. So he's an interesting uh, guy to write about. I don't know if you've, you've heard about him. Dutch guy, uh, judoka, karate guy. Oh, uh, yeah. This so, so. cushion guy and a um, really interesting person. He's a uh, great big guy. Great big yeah. guy. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. yeah very outspoken <laughs> extremely outspoken really? yeah. uh, in, in, incredible history uh, also a soldier and and, and much and uh, lots 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 of stuff I'll send you some stuff uh, in, a, in, a, in a private email later but uh, sure. that, that that could be a fun uh, a fun project oh yeah I've, I've done articles biography articles I like it's a lot of fun to do and, yeah and, yeah uh, so I'm gonna make okay well I think we're almost at uh, the 90 minute mark. So uh, I think pretty much uh, we've, we've covered all the questions. So I'm happy with that. I hope all the listeners and my patrons are happy that we, we try to cover as many as possible. Um, I'm going to put in the show notes direct link to your website and to your Facebook page so that people can contact you or or, or just see you know all the stuff you, you, you have available. Uh, any parting words, anything you want to? Uh, yeah, if, I have street lessons up on my site, but I don't have any copies yet. Uh, okay. this, the new system with Amazon is the authors get their, their copies three or four weeks after. Uh, people were, <laughs> when that book went live, people were buying it immediately, and I don't even have any copies of it, and I won't get it until January 3rd, but they can always, if they want to order one, they can order it, and I'll just ship it when I get them, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yep. Okay. Well, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Lauren, for your time. I appreciate it a lot um i hope uh, i hope all the listeners you know enjoyed it as well and and uh, i promise uh, we'll we're not going to wait two years for doing it yeah. another time okay, <laughs> okay. I'm, getting, I'm getting older and older you have to wake me up from time to time you know? <laughs> okay great <laughs> right. okay thanks very much lauren take care right, thanks thank you bye bye, -bye.